Hello everybody, and today I'm going to talk about something that, well, I guess I've been thinking about for a while now, and it was recently articulated quite nicely in an article I just read on Eon about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And I have a link to that article in the description box below. Now, in order to get to my main point for this video, I'm going to need to first talk a bit about quantum mechanics. And I'll go into just enough detail, I promise, to confuse you completely, and then I'll stop. Because that's what I do. Now, there's a lot of strange stuff in quantum mechanics. I mean, we've all known this for a while now, and at the heart of the theory is Schrodinger's equation, which has its roots in a scientific discovery that happened early in the 20th century. It turns out that when you pass a stream of electrons, which are discrete subatomic particles, through two slits, they make an interference pattern on the detector as if they were a wave. So, when people saw this, they went, hey, hang on just a minute. How can a discrete particle like an electron act like a wave? So in one of the greatest scientific surprises of all times, it seems that particles, indeed all of matter, can also act like waves. Now cutting a really, really long story short, Schrodinger's equation describes the wave-like properties that all matter has. It answered the question, what does the wave-like particle properties of a particle look like mathematically? Well, it looks like this. <laughs> Schrodinger's equation is to quantum mechanics what Newton's second law of motion is to classical mechanics. It describes how a physical system, say a bunch of particles subject to certain forces, will change over time. And when applied to more complicated things besides particles like cats and boxes and stuff like that, we get probable outcomes from Schrodinger's equation. So, if this equation is a probability distribution, in other words, a picture of the possibilities of where a particle might be, then questions like, where is the particle when we aren't looking, don't have any meaning. Is the cat alive or dead? Again, quantum mechanics has only one answer to this. The particle is in all of those places and the cat is both alive and dead. And scientists don't just mean this rhetorically, folks. They mean it, and this is important, literally. When we're not looking at it, a hypothetical particle is everywhere as defined by that equation. And the cat is actually both alive and dead. Actually and for real, okay? According to quantum mechanics, until you look at something or try to measure it, any particle you try to pin down to one spot is not possible. That particle is actually in all locations defined by Schrodinger's equation. All of them. And I can't overstate this enough. The particle is actually in all those places at once. <laughs> I know, right? So setting aside for the moment the complete brain meltdown that this gives me, we have to ask one more thing. What happens to the particle or the cat when we are looking? And the next question that always pops into my mind is, why does it even matter if I look or not? Now, I don't know the answer to that second question, but I don't think anyone does. But the answer to the first one is, the wave function collapses. By looking upon a particle or opening a box with a cat in it, we've gone from all of it is happening to just one of the things is happening. Now, you may be asking, why does it collapse? No one knows. Now, what I've just outlined to you is a somewhat retarded and most definitely incomplete description of what is known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it was developed by lots and lots of really smart people in the early 20th century. Okay, so let's fast forward to the 1950s to a smart guy named Hugh Everett III, who asked the really important question that apparently everyone else was avoiding. What if, when you observe something, the wave function doesn't collapse? That's a good question. Everett, so Everett wrote his doctoral thesis and got his PhD and then promptly left academia. I guess his, he felt like his work here was done. <laughs> Now, to let you know, I'm currently reading Sean Carroll's book on this, which is right here, and I invite you to do the same. The link is in the description box. 
I'm not done with it yet, but my overlying point that I'm trying to make here doesn't require that I finish it. Only get through these ideas so that I can make my point. So, what if the wave function doesn't collapse? What would that look like? If the wave function doesn't collapse when you make an observation, then all of the possibilities are real. All of them. Real. At one time. Everett said that it's our concept of reality that's the problem. We only think that there's a single outcome of a measurement. But in fact, all of them occur. We only see one of those realities, but the others have a separate physical existence too. Now this implies that the entire universe is described by a gigantic wave function that contains within it all possible realities. This universal wave function, as Everett called it in his thesis, begins as a combination or a superposition of all possible states of its constituent particles. As it evolves, some of these superpositions break down, making certain realities distinct and isolated from one another. In this sense, Worlds are not exactly created by measurements, they're just separated. Okay, now, this may be a total crap example, but I'll do it anyway. The, the image that came to my mind when I was thinking about that was that of a comb. The comb is the wave function, and the teeth of the comb are all the realities. And when you choose one tooth, the others are still right there, right next to you, and they're all going along right beside you as you go through time. And of course, the comb is infinitely long. <laughs> I don't know. It helped me when I, when I was thinking about this, so maybe it'll help you. I don't, I don't know. So if all the possible outcomes of a quantum measurement have a real existence, then where are they? And why do we see, or at least we think we see, only one? This is where the many worlds come in. All the other outcomes of a measurement must exist in a parallel reality, another world. To use a very simple example, if you measure the path of an electron, and in this world it seems to go that way, <laughs> but in another world it went that way, well, for that other world you'd need a parallel identical apparatus to, to detect that electron, and naturally it requires a parallel U to observe it, because only through the act of measurement does the wave function seem to collapse. Now, if this is the way things are, then duplication seems to have no end. You, ha you have to build an entire parallel universe around that one electron going the other way, identical to the one you're in in all respects, except where the electron went. You avoid the complication of wave function collapse, <laughs> but at the expense of making an entirely other universe. Okay, so now I've botched up talking about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, and I think I've done enough damage here to finally make my point. If this theory is right, and these other worlds, an infinite number by now, exist, then how can we test this theory to see if it's right? What data back up this claim? For this to be a scientific theory and be considered science, I think we need to be able to test this theory, right? Well, you can't. There is no way ever to interact with those other parallel realities. This theory has no hope of coming into contact with actual empirical data that we can see. Now, it may trouble you to know, I mean it was for me, that many prominent physicists, Martin Rees, which is Britain's astronomer royal, uh, David Deutsch and others, among them my personal cosmological hero Sean Carroll from Caltech, have all claimed strong support for the idea going so far as to say that it is real and we should just get over it. This is the way things are. No data? No problem. The theory is true because it's the best explanation, with no indication of who it is best for or who is making the judgment that, it's, that it still might reasonably be true. But from where I sit, and admittedly I'm sitting in a pretty small chair here, no one's really listening to me, this isn't science. The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics has no hope of making any contact with verif verifiable data. So on what grounds can the claim be made that this is science? But let's be clear for a moment. Answering the question of what science is is actually surprisingly hard. Many smart people have tried and failed to give us a definition of science that is coherent and consistent. 
So to cut an all, another long story very, very short, no one really knows what science is. And so we are basically left with the notion that while we don't exactly know what science is, whatever it is, we'll know it when we see it. I'm serious. That's the punchline to the entire history of philosophy of science in just a few sentences. We'll know it when we see it. And many worlds isn't the only area in science where this is being done to. Our best theory for what matter is leaves out 95% of what's actually out there. Where's the other 95%? Well, it's around and between galaxies making them spin in a certain way. What is it? Don't know. The same with the energy content of the universe. Why is the universe accelerating? Don't know. What is it? Don't know. Our best theories about really important things are disturbingly incomplete. And while people are making honest attempts to understand what's going on, the language we're hearing is remarkably non-scientific. We may never measure dark matter. We may never see what dark energy really is. We can never ever interact with dark matter in any way. I mean, jeebus, that's pretty sad. Now, similar stuff is said when talking about multiverses and string theory. I mean, none of it's testable, observable, nor verifiable. But, oh, wait a second. It's there. Trust me. Folks, we are living in an era of post-empirical science. All of this is suspiciously snake oil salesman And maybe we will one day uncover what dark matter and dark energy is. But according to the many-world interpretation of quantum mechanics, we will never, ever, ever be able to interact with our parallel selves or, or see anything having to do with these other universes at all. And the same thing can be said about string theories and cosmic landscapes. Is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics science? While we may not be able to say what exactly science is, I can say that I prefer to have my science with a little bit of data in it. Now, for me to recognize science when I see it, <laughs> it has to come with some observations or something verifiable. But hey, you know, that's just me. And apparently, I guess, I'm in the minority on this. Now, you may very well ask, oh, come on, what's the big deal? Who cares if a bunch of cosmological poindexters write some papers that only get read amongst themselves, that have a bunch of math in it, and have no practical value to us whatsoever? Well, my answer to you is, first, you can bet that they're not the only ones reading these papers. The science news outlets get this stuff and all the time, and they mangle it up. But the big deal here is that now we live in a world of enormous distrust in science and basically everyday knowledge in general. From climate change deniers, anti-vaxxers, to flat earthers, there is a massive distrust coming from these groups. And they flourish by sowing misinformation, pseudoscience, and just plain nonsense. And I can tell you this, if I were someone who believed in intelligent design and in an omniscient creator, I'd be very interested in this discussion surrounding the many worlds theory, because I'd be listening to a lot of respected scientists accepting unverifiable, untestable ideas and saying it's science, and wondering if there's not just a little bit of a double standard being applied here. If many worlds is just as untestable as an intelligent designer, then why isn't the latter considered science? It's a valid question in this scenario. So while all of this stuff is really interesting to think about and to play with, I don't think it's science, by any real meaning of the word anyway. If science is defined by I'll know it when I see it, then I have to conclude this ain't it. I'm reminded of Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Now, maybe this era of post-empirical science is a stressor. Maybe all these untestable ideas we're hearing about almost every day is a strain on the current scientific paradigm that is really struggling to explain a lot about our universe. The amount and nature of almost all the matter in the universe, the reason for universal expansion, and even the rate at which it is doing it, it seems just too hard for our current scientific paradigm to solve. Now, it should be said that maybe that strain will be relieved, the strain on the current scientific paradigm will be relieved when a new discovery is made. Maybe Kuhn's right, and science progresses in jumps and fits and starts that ultimately lead to progress. I don't know about that for sure, but things are getting really weird in science right now, and I sincerely hope Kuhn is right, 
and that the next discovery brings back some data-enhanced science again. All right, well, that's it for now, space fans. I'm sure you'll let me know what you think about this in the comment section below. I want to thank all Deep Astronomy Patreon patrons for making this video possible. And if you like this content, please consider supporting the Deep Astronomy Patreon page with whatever amount you find reasonable. Every bit goes back into making more content. And thanks to all of you for watching. And as always, keep looking up.